Uh, next up is Elizabeth Wurig, and she's going to tell us about uh, the system design and research landscape through process and data modeling. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> and she's a little bit of a challenge to read, but welcome. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Elizabeth Wurig, and I will be talking about why research analysis is very important in software development. So I'm going to talk about how we do our research process for requirements. We first start off with our milestones, and that kind of sets the way that we do all of our requirements analysis and our documentation process. Um, the first step in our milestone is our information discovery phase, where we talk to the pilot group and discover what the requirements are and kind of figure out the whole entire process. Um, once we have the requirements, we go ahead and document, document them during the pilot requirement analysis. So why bother having requirements driven or development? As you can see in this picture, everyone in the process has a different picture of what the end product will look like. The customer wants a three-tier swing when they actually really need a tire swing. So it's very important to get a clear picture of what they want and what they really need. So a requirements driven development is a written agreement between the developers and the customers. That way you have Sign off at each step to make sure you have exactly what the requirement is. It also helps scope out the project. So that way you can cover what's in scope and you don't cover what's out of scope. It's also a good design practice and requirements definition because it's an industry best standard to have documentation for everything you do. You don't want to go and start coding stuff that's not been required or talked about with the stakeholder. It also helps improve the success of the effort which is very important in the DoD because it has such a high failure rate. Um, almost 80% of all software off the shelf fails in the DoD department. And of that, only 20% of it is success, and three quarters of that requires significant post-release modification. So that really leaves about five to 10% that are considered tr truly successful. So how do you make requirements, uh, your software good? You have requirements governments. Requirements governance is a standardizing all requirement documentation, and it's a requirements gathering process. So it kind of helps give a clear understanding of what needs to be discovered and written down and documented. It also helps a way for you to present it to the stakeholders. So we use milestones to kind of help guide our requirements governance. We start off with our kickoff phase, which is when we talk to the interview. We have an interview with all the stakeholders, and we kind of gather the whole entire process. This is a very long thing because it lasts about nine to 12 months because it takes a long time to go through their process and for the development phase. Once we start the kickoff, we also go into a network connection. We want to make sure that they have access to everything that they need. We also give them everything that we have developed, such as the hub. We want to make sure that they like what we have to offer and get any feedback so that we can start making adjustments as we go forward. We also want to have um, documentation to go with it, which is our written agreement between them. So once we have a clear picture of everything, we go ahead and start documenting everything through use case, wireframes, and class diagrams, which I will heavily discuss later on. Once we have all of our documentation and a sign-off, we have a critical design review, which is where the analyst and the stakeholders sit down, review everything before we start developing, and get a sign-off on it. Once it's been approved, it starts being developed in our implementation of CRD components. This is when the development team starts working on it, and then we start testing it once they're finished. Once it's been tested and ready to go, we give it to the user group for them to make sure that they like it and start using it, and that's during system integration. Once, it, once, it, once they've approved it, we then go through the change control board, which goes through the approval process of it. So like I said, in our first step after our kickoff phase, we have our information discovery. We meet with them to discuss the whole entire process and map out everything that we're going to do so that they kind of understand the timeline because it is such a very long process. We meet with them for about an hour a week for about nine to 12 months. So they want to know why they're wasting their time with us. Um, during this process, we deliver a process flow diagram, a list of assets, and a list of actors, which I'll explain those in a minute. And like I said before, we have to meet about once a week to go over everything just because there's so much and we want to make sure we're always has the newest information. So here's an example of our instrument matrix and our user matrix. Um, our instrument matrix includes the instrument name, function, operating system, and location. All this is important information to give the help desk so we can create help desk tickets that are very useful to the help desk tickets and to make sure we can easily integrate with them. 
we don't want to create something that they won't be able to run on their PCs. And then also the user matrix is also very important for the same reason. We want to make sure that they have access to everything that they need and that they can use all the machines that they need to use. One of the longest parts of the stakeholder meetings is our process flow. We use BPMN, which is Business Process Model and Notation, and we use this because it's pretty easy for everyone to read. It's just a very simple diagram of how it connects. It also helps us see the overall flow of everything and where we can integrate ICE into. We have start events and we have tasks. We have data inputs. And as you can see in the picture, we have little green boxes where we think ICE would be able to really help improve their process. So it's a really good way to communicate the procedures and the behaviors. The stakeholders find this really helpful because they oftentimes don't even think about their whole entire process. So it's good to see it all documented out and they can see what ways they can improve it and why they really are doing the things that they do. So once we have the whole process flow, we can go ahead and start thinking about the ways ICE will actually integrate with their research process. We first do this through a use case, which is a step-by-step -step detailed process describing the flow of events. It also helps us include all the actors, the triggers, the dependencies, start events, end events. That way it's a very formal written documentation of what the system will do and what the system won't do. It gives them a very clear picture of how it'll work. And this is really helpful for the stakeholders so that way they can see exactly how it will work. And we can continue on to a wireframe, which is a visual representation of how the system will look. Stakeholders really like this too because they like pictures. So they can actually see the way the system will work, how the user can interact with it, and just to make sure that it has everything that they need. Here's an example of our wireframe. We use a program called Lucid Charts to develop it. It's where you drag and drop shapes on. And it's really easy to manipulate and change. It's also collaborative. So if I'm out sick one day, someone else can go on to Lucid Charts and do the same thing as I, I can. And that way, we always have the most updated version. We have different like drop-down boxes. We have text boxes. We have action buttons. So it's really useful. And there's a lot of power that you can do with it. So if you, once you have your class diagram, once you have your use case and your wireframe, you can create a class diagram, but you do not need that in order to create a class diagram. I personally use it to make it easier so you can see a big picture of everything and all the different elements that'll go into it. So a class diagram is the main building blocks of object-oriented modeling. So it can be used for conceptual and detailed representative analysis. And it's a great way to get an overview of how the system will work, because it's kind of hard to tell from just pictures and words. That way you can actually see representation of the relationships between the objects and their classes. Here's an example of a class diagram. So this is just a simple order diagram. So order is the abstract class, and then customer and normal orders are the concrete classes. You can only have a custom order or normal order for an order, and an order must have at least one customer. But a customer doesn't have to have an order. And all the different information in there, like name, location, date, number, they're all elements within a class. So you can kind of see how it all ties together and how you can create the relationship together. So why bother doing requirements analysis? Like I said before, it's really important to have it so you can get a clear picture of the whole thing and to figure out what the customer wants. You don't want to give them something that they don't want or won't use. That's what most people just assume that it will be this way and that's the way that they want it. And the customer gets and it's like, nope, this is not what I wanted. So how do you make sure you give them something that they really want? You want to make sure you keep asking why. Why do you do it this way? Why do you do this? Industry best standard is to ask why five times for every topic. You want to do this because you want to come down to the very bottom. And a lot of times, researchers will leave out information that are very critical to it. So they'll be like, why do you need to know I opened a lid to this, or something like that. We just want to get a very, very clear picture of their whole entire process. It's also really important to define standards. If you have everyone creating different documentation, Nothing will ever look the same, and it gets really confusing for the development team and for stakeholders that you're working with. Like, well, we didn't have to do that with the other team. And it's also really good to have a very uniform look at all your documents. So for example, we have a use case standard that says you have to use colors for any of the actors. And then we also have a very um, template for use cases that start off with triggers, prerequisites, actors, start and end events. So we can kind of see the clear picture of everything. And it's nothing like new for the development team when they get it. So they can easily read it and understand it and not focus on trying to find where things are. It's also really important to be aware of scope creep and to be bounded by a process. You don't want to have all these grand ideas 
and then lose our focus of what the main event was. You need to focus on the event and not go outside of bounds. It's really easy to do that when you get really excited about your process. You're like, oh yeah, we can do that, we can do that, we can do that. But you need to stay in scope or else you'll lose key functionality. And it also sucks because you're trying to do too much at once. So it's really important to start small and adapt and grow over the time. Again, for the same reason, you'll lose quality and you can lose some key functionality there. So you need to take it bit by bit. We start off with one pilot group and then as we get them well into the process phase, we then started to add another pilot group. So it's really important to slowly add things in so you're not overwhelming yourself and losing face with the customers. Any questions? <laughs>